more to buy. You buy it. We pay homage to all the gurus from time immemorial. Libation. Igun Mojiba, Ibai. We pay homage to our spiritual ancestors and predecessors who have gone before us, who left us their spiritual DNA, their legacy of love, who were great heroes, mystics, sages, and adepts, who went through the process of self and God realization so that we too may realize their condition in this very lifetime. Libation. <coughs> Sangha Mojiba, Ibai. We pay homage to all the spiritual community who preceded our community, who worked in the spirit of great reciprocity and cooperation to preserve the Dharma in its various forms in behalf of the Dharma givers who love the Dharma, who demonstrated the beautiful behavior that we too may become a great Sangha. Libations. We pay homage to our beloved Sant Sat Guru, a perfect living master and saint whose lineage that this house comes from, who gave us his sons, his gurus, to continue his dharma, his teaching, and his legacy of love. We thank you, Maharaji, Sharon Singh Ji, libations. Thanks for saying I'm mad at the 
says Romy is the uh, same thing that the uh, moth is looking for when it flies into a flame. Whatever this is, says Romy, is uh, what the stars crossing across the sky at night is also seeking. What is this? That is the question. This, uh, whatever it is that uh, humanity has been in search of since uh, time immemorial. Rumi says, uh, that's what we all are looking for, is some of this. So my hope is that uh, in this new year that you uh, find some of this and bring your seeking to an end.
And I suppose that the uh, answer to the question, what is this that must be found in order to bring all seeking to an end? Could be uh, said to be your purpose in life. At some level, uh, we're all seeking to find uh, this unknown purpose uh, of our life, upon finding which uh, our life uh, becomes meaningful and worth living. If you haven't found the purpose of your life, then uh, that life time that has been lived off the mark and not rooted in your purpose is lifetime that has been uh, wasted. So what is this purpose that, that uh, you must find and fulfill for the sake of uh, making your life meaningful and worthwhile. Please turn your cell phone off. If you uh, do everything not uh, do that which you were born to do, then uh, it is as if you have done nothing. And you will know that because you will feel like uh, you haven't done nothing with your can't do anything with your life until you first find the purpose of your life. So it's not merely an academic uh, question that uh, is being put forward by the song uh, or the poem of uh, Chang Tabriz is say, uh, fundamental question that must be answered by each and every one of us, you see. In fact, that's the whole uh, purport underlying the tradition of uh, making New Year's resolution is trying to uh, somehow or another live on purpose, to bring more purpose into your life. You're trying to refine your living up until this day, looking at it, setting your life in the palm of your hand, to refine it, uh, to somehow or another uh, make your life more purposeful. Some people think it's, a, it's about uh, losing a few more pounds and they make that their resolution to lose some weight as if by losing weight you will add some kind of uh, purpose and depth to your life, you see. And, uh, that's not it. So I'm resolved to uh, stop drinking, stop smoking, spend more time with the wife and children and so forth and so on. You all are familiar with the kind of uh, pedestrian and uh, conventional resolutions that uh, people make on uh, New Year's Eve. But alas, in spite of all of those uh, resolutions, uh, even those that are kept 
failed to yield the feeling of uh, meaningfulness and worth that they are searching for. So what is the purpose of life? Let us consider that. you get everything else done in this life, but don't get that which you were born to get done, done, then you have uh, fundamentally wasted your life. And the proof will be in your experience of uh, meaninglessness. So what is the purpose of your life, beloved? It's not a rhetorical question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Great for an what is the uh, purpose of uh, your life? There are certain primordial questions that every intelligent and conscious human being must uh, confront. And the purpose of your life is one of those questions that you must ask yourself and answer. No one else can tell you. Hmm? <coughs> what is the purpose of your life? What are you uh, using your lifetime for? And there's millions of things that you can use your lifetime for. It's people use their lifetime for all kinds of things. How many of us are using our lifetime in living for the purpose for which it has been given us? Hmm? If all you are going to do is eat and sleep and have sex and maintain your body in a state of comfort, you didn't need to have a human body to do that, did you, do you? Hmm? You could have been given the body of a squirrel or a rat or any other lower form of life and accomplish that if that's a your only goal and purpose in life is sensual gratification at the level of your body. You don't need a human life for that, do you? You must have a higher purpose than mere. Maraji uh, used to always say that, uh, uh, especially for those of us who are uh, are fortunate enough to uh, be given nam, to be given initiation and so forth and so on, that uh, from that point forward, uh, our duty and purpose in life become absolutely clear, doesn't it? Hmm? <coughs> Maharaj used to say, beloved, that uh, our first and foremost duty and purpose in life is to achieve just that, self-realization. That's what it's about. Hmm? And Maharaji says uh, as a secondary duty and purpose that we have in life, because it's twofold, Maharaji said, is the secondary duty and purpose we have in this human lifetime is to uh, nobody uh, awakens from the sleep of ego. Without grace, nobody becomes conscious. It is always about grace. Everybody that has found the path uh, has been the recipient of grace. The path has come into all of our life by an act of pure grace. Somebody flips on a TV and hear somebody talking dumb, it's just grace. You pick up a flyer, a book, someone invites you to a song, or you hear some, a, a conversation, it's all grace. 
Aldrich. As a ego-bound individual, there's uh, simply uh, no way out of that condition except by grace. So our hearing the Dharma, beloved, coming in contact with the Dharma, this is an act of grace, not an accident. It's grace. Mm -hmm. Amazing grace at that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Unwarranted unmerited, nothing that you've done. Hmm? And this grace comes to sinners, you see, as well as to saints. Hmm? Completely unpredictable, uncontrollable. Can't be forced. There are no steps that you take that will result in the experience of grace. It's not that kind of a show can't bring it under your control, can't do anything about it, hmm? grace. It's grace that brought you here and it's grace that will take you home. You're even alive by grace. recognition of grace is a sign of awakening. It's grace for us that brings us to the path. That carry us along the path every uh, step of the way. It's always grace. When I heard Dharma, you see, I, I didn't know what Dharma was. And I'm a, an 18 year old kid working in a warehouse on the south side of Chicago. See? And it was uh, a co worker, an older gentleman, right? That uh, was used by the source of grace, you see, to uh, speak some words of Dharma to me. Otherwise, I would have missed it. So from my side, you know, it just looked just like an accident, you know. I mean, he's there, he's on the path, he, and giving me a some of that teaching, you see? And why me? Well, nothing special about me. It's just how it works. But if you just reflect and see uh, in your own case, how did you come across the path? I mean, have you all reflected on that? Mm -hmm. Just, uh, you know what I mean? Just stumbled, somebody gave you a book. Uh, <laughs> It's all kinds of stories and leelas that we can tell about how we came unto the path, as you see. And then your life has changed forever. come in contact with some of this. Some of this. You didn't even know you were looking for some of this. <laughs> Is that about right? I had no idea. You're feeling with that. I don't need any of this. Right. I've met brothers and sisters who are atheists. You know what I mean? They don't even believe there's a God in all this nonsense until they encounter some of this. Uh, 
at some point in your spiritual career, you reach a point of maturity where you are able to take it on the spot. So the uh, spiritual literature of all of the various great traditions on the planet is full of stories. Saul on his way to Damascus, you see, had the experience and uh, became changed. Grace changes when you receive it. You know. So, so much more can be said about it, you see. Something else to say? Discuss? Yes, beloved. Mm -hmm. So how does one um, begin to discover who he or she is mm. in the midst of um, other people defining for a long time mm. a particular individual? So how does that person begin to break through all of that stuff and really find out his or her core? Mm. And I'm appreciative of the fact that you, when you talk about grace, that unearned, unmerited favor, so I realize the favor is there, so how does one start to access that and begin the process of change? Well, I think in, in your question, you have also uh, contained the answer. First, everything starts with grace. And usually it's in the form of hearing for the first time from the uh, mouth of the, uh, the adept or the guru that you are not who you think you are. Nobody has ever told you that. You see? That's the first grace. That's the gospel. That's the great revelation that is freely given to you. You see? You would have never in a million lifetimes doubted that you are who you think you are. You are fully convicted about it. Hmm? It almost sounds insane. For someone to uh, say to you that uh, you're not who you think you are. And not only are you not who you think you are, you are something that is not even comprehensible by thinking. It cannot even be comprehended through any act of rationalization. You follow me? In fact, you are something that is divine. You see, you are suited, you are spirit, you are soul, you are a drop of the divine. You are God. Nobody ever talked to you like that, you see. They say you're an asshole or you're a bitch <laughs> or that, but nobody's ever said you're God, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. And was serious about it and treated you as such. Mm -hmm. Loved you as such, you follow me? The saints and sages then not only give us uh, these kind of statements, they give us the experience of being something greater than who you think you are. And that's the distinction. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They don't merely uh, wrap out a philosophy to you. They enter into a relationship with you mm -hmm. and transmit to you the experience of being something far, far greater and more worthwhile than who you uh, think you are, you see? They love you beyond the limitations of your ego, you see? So grace is the, there at the very beginning, you see, in the form of the great revelation, hmm? the preaching of the gospel. And our usual reaction to that is that uh, this is impossible. This is too much. You know what I mean? You can't even conceive of yourself as being something more than this uh, body, mind, your emotions, your feelings, uh, the history, the associated with uh, this package, you know, the autobiographical self. You can't even conceive of it. You see? And that's the tug of war between Buddha and disciples to 
convince you that you are not who you think you are and you are capable of way more than you think you are. Those are the two propositions that the guru argues. You see? And then you enter into the process, you see, beloved. You learn how to now conduct that experiment that validates the claims that the guru is making. They show you how to engage in that process of self-observation. Hmm? They show you how to look at who you've been thinking you are so that you can see that you are not that. You follow me? Yeah. Hmm? They engage you in the process of knowing thyself. Knowing thyself is a process. Hmm? It's something you must engage in, you see? They take you by the hand and take you on a journey into your land of ego self <laughs> and point out <laughs> you're not that, you're not that. A process of nete, nete as they have called it in the Hindu philosophy and in the East, you see, nete, nete. Because you cannot arrive at the experience of yourself objectively because you cannot be an object to yourself. Are you following my argument, you see? It is absolute subjectivity. They cannot, by definition, be made into an object. You can't look at yourself like you can look at me, mm -hmm. right? Because it's the self looking at me, mm -hmm. right? So your experience of the self is never direct. It cannot be, by definition. The way you come into self-realization is through the realization of who and what you are not. It's a process of subtraction, elimination, elimination. And what's left is the incomparable you, the incomprehensible you. <laughs> you see, beyond mind, can't be compromised, uh, comprehended by mind, you see? It emerges, mm -hmm. it shines through now. Mm -hmm. So the process, you see, beloved, is one of uh, nete nete, of, of elimination, of really examining all of the things that uh, you base your sense of self on and examining them and seeing is that really so. Hmm? Now you say I'm this physical body. Well, this is 99.9% .9 uh, empty space here. What Einstein called an optical illusion in consciousness, as is all matter. And if you have that kind of scientific uh, uh, mind, you can appreciate the argument of the physicist. Any uh, run-of-the-mill physicist will tell you that uh, what you are perceiving as self in terms of your body is purely illusion. Right? Pure. You don't have to uh, <coughs> believe in what the Buddha or Mahavira or any of these great saints have said. Uh, Stephen Hawkins will tell you the same thing. You have to pay a big tuition, about $45,000 a year, <laughs> about uh, <coughs> 10 years of your life. But, uh, the, you know, get uh, a PhD in physics uh, will uh, heal you of this illusion of being the body. You look under a microscope and you'll see. Hmm? That this body can't be me. It's nothing. absolutely nothing. You only are having the illusion of seeing something solid because your senses limits your perception. So. To believe in uh, matter is a, a form of being naive. So the saints, in some sense, you see, do what a physicist does, but uh, in a different way. They take you on the journey. And they explore, OK. They don't argue, say, OK, so this is who you think you are, right? Good. Let's start with that. Mm -hmm. right. Now let's look at it. You know what I mean? Calmly, coolly, and rationally. See? And uh, help you to see. That's not me. That's not me. That's 
not D. That's not D. And they start unraveling this uh, illusion that you have created of being the contents of your experience. You see, beloved? Are you the uh, awareness that is aware of the phenomena that is arising in the field of awareness? Or are you the contents that are arising? <laughs> I mean, you can't be both. Mm -hmm. So you must resolve this double-mindedness about the very nature of yourself, you see. You begin to inspect this whole notion. In Buddhism, one of the principal pillars of Buddhism, I know most people are familiar with the Four Noble Truths when you say Buddhism, that's the first thing, but, you know, the, the pillars of Buddhism is made up of... Uh, Dukkha, suffering, impermanence, and a third pillar, they call it anatta, no self. The person, the self that you think you are, there is no such thing. And it is the recognition of that that is part of what is meant by enlightenment in the Buddhist tradition. You have realized that uh, the self that you've been thinking you are, there is no such thing. Anatta. No personal self. The personal self that you feel you are is pure illusion. No basis in reality whatsoever. It's just something you're making up in your mind. It's a mind construct. It's a mental construct. You see? It's something like what happened to people who are institutionalized, you know, who think they're John Brown or George Washington. Mm -hmm. you, you, you're doing something similar to that, you know. <laughs> you think, oh, I'm both one right Africa, I'm side right, you know, something similar to that, a kind of a form of insanity. That's what insanity is, clinically speaking, it's when you don't know who you are. Is that about right? Yes. When you really don't know who you really are and are operating on the presumption that you are this character that you have invented in your mind, you are technically uh, insane. And you behave insanely. <laughs> don't you? Yes. 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 So just as the crazy person in the institution is not getting any satisfaction in people buying into him as being Abraham Lincoln, they're certainly not treating him like he's Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> 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 right? So you walking around with this concept of who you think you are, and ain't nobody cooperating with you. <laughs> Pissing you off, you see. <laughs> Most of your conflict with other people is based on their failure to uh, treat you in a way that is consistent with this imaginary being that you think you are. You're thinking you all that in a bag of chips and uh, they're telling you uh, you ain't shit. <laughs> Conflict. <laughs> right. So the uh, the adepts, you see, beloved, uh, uh, shine some light into the darkness of your ignorance, you see? That's what Guru means, one who shines light. Hmm? So that you can see. But you must see. You must have the courage to even look. Hmm? You see? And endure the ordeal of ego realization. There must first be ego realization before there can be self-realization. Sure. Follow my argument, beloved? You must realize who you are not <coughs> as a prerequisite for the realization of who you are. You see, I've simply called it ego realization. You must realize your ego. You must look at yourself. You must really look and see hmm? that you're just an ego. Hmm? You're in a state of uh, misidentification of self with that which is not self. 
That's what the ego condition is. Making something that is nothing like you the same as you. And the Guru moves you further along in this uh, process, you see. And addresses your whole concept of what is mine. Because you've been thinking something down here is yours. Is that right? Yeah. This is mine. This is mine. But I used to say, first thing you got to get straight about is to realize that don't nothing belong to you. Absolutely nothing. Not even this body mind. This body belongs to nature. Not to you. Try to keep it. Go ahead. <laughs> Go ahead. Try to hang on to it. <laughs> Try to take it with you. <laughs> it's not even yours. That's why you can't take it nowhere. You can't do nothing. It ain't yours. You can't stop it from getting old. You can't stop it from getting sick. It is not connected with your will at all. The body belongs to nature. It ain't yours. Same is the case with your mind. You have no control over it. It thinks when you don't want it to think. <laughs> you have no control over it. It's not yours. It's a mechanism. Are you with me? So nothing in is yours. What to say of your own body mind, you see? Your wife is not yours. The children are not yours. Nothing belongs to you. Get straight. Get clear. So much of your suffering, dukkha, is based on the presumption that you own someone or something, and you don't own nobody and no thing. Nor are you owned by anybody or anything. Are you with me? Yes, sir. You can only... Uh, Live that level of wisdom once you realize yourself. At the level of your ego, you can't live like that because ego is the presumption that you do own something. You follow what I'm saying? <coughs> and so when you said, this is mine, you set yourself up for suffering. Mm -hmm. Not merely said at the level of your mouth. That, that language is such that we can't avoid these kind of uh, <coughs> statements. But inside yourself, you should know. It's just a linguistic convenience. It ain't true. You follow what I'm saying? It's not mine. But once you label it mine, you have cr created the extended self, as we say in the culture of psychology. There's the autobiographical self. You see, made up of your memories, blah, blah, blah. And then there's the extended sense of self, where you have incorporated other things and people into your fundamental sense of who you are. You do that whenever you label it as uh, mine, you see, or my. You have extended your sense of self. So whatever happens to my car is just like happening to me. And your car belongs to the realm of impermanence. Some shit gonna happen to it. <laughs> Is that about right? And that's how the dukkha s slips into your life, right? The more you have a sense of possession, the more you suffer. And you will suffer even if you don't have possession because you'll say, oh, I don't have nothing. I'm nobody. I'm therefore suffering. You see, it, it cuts both ways, right? So poverty is not an antidote. <laughs> <laughs> Impoverished people are suffering even more because they operate on an illusion. If I had this, then I could be more. You follow me? Yes, sir. There's a lot more that can be said about it, beloved. Uh, we used to have cooler groups that used to sit around and talk about that, but that's all over now. <laughs> but uh, the first thing is that you uh, have to be able to even challenge your whole notion that of 
being who you think you are. You must be able to do that first before the process can begin. You, see? you must overcome your fear of that. You see, you must be a seeker of the truth. You see, you must possess that kind of fearlessness that only a real, authentic seeker of truth possess. You know, and you really want to know the truth. You see, am I? who I think I am, which is based on feedback from other people, as you rightly point out, because uh, you know, 99.9% .9 of who you think you are is made up of feedback, mm. right? The rest is pure imagination that you added to it. <laughs> <laughs> so you're made up of uh, imagination and feedback. <laughs> <laughs> and feedback from people who don't know who they are. <laughs> so. You see the dilemma? <laughs> <laughs> and you're attached to that image. Mm -hmm. And you're trying to live up to that image, which means you're trying to live up to a mirage. <laughs> so the more you try to be yourself, the more unreal you become. Mm -hmm. And when you succeed, you have succeeded at being absolutely unreal, phony, non-existent, absent, hmm? totally possessed, dead. Jesus said you're dead, unconscious. The, the European mystic Gurdjieff said that uh, at that moment, when you bought the whole propaganda that who you think you are is based upon, Gurdjieff said that very moment you forfeit your soul, you don't even have a soul no more. Mm -hmm. You become a soulless thing. Mm -hmm. Kabir Saab says that you become like the bellows of a blacksmith. You, mm -hmm. Yes, air go in and out, but you're not really breathing. You're not really human. Kabir said you're not even a human being. But you cling to this uh, socially manufactured sense of self with a little imagination added in because uh, you don't know who you are. That's why you cling to it. Are you with me? Yes. Because you must have a sense of self. And since you don't know who you really are, you are you are clinging to what, who they told you you are, and you attach to them, full of all kind of sympathy for it. You see, one of the most difficult tasks that uh, the spiritual adept or teacher is confronted with in serving the seeker of truth and self-realization is to break their attachment to their ego of all kind of sympathy with it. You must lose all sympathy with it. It's not who you are. Why are you crying about this? Resist it. Reluctant. Have eyes but cannot see, ears but cannot hear. not even wanting to see, convinced beyond all doubt that you are this character that you invented in high school somewhere. And you suffer. So this is why you see uh, the African sages and mystic long before the Greeks uh, even emerge on the planet, understood the importance of uh, finding out the answer to the question, who am I? And so at uh, Edfu and Karnak, this is what was established in those great mystery schools. You must know thyself. I care how much uh, you, math you know, physics you know, literature you know, and trivia. Hmm? If you don't know yourself, you are fundamentally ignorant. You 
don't know who you are. And believing that you are this body, mostly, most people's sense of self is made up of 95% uh, identification with the body and all the activities associated with it as being equal to who and what they are. <coughs> and yet this body exists in the realm of impermanence, right? So that means you got a problem with death now, right? Because <laughs> <laughs> yeah. if I'm the body, then you will die, right? Mm -hmm. You ain't that stupid, right? <laughs> you know that, right? So now you got, here's a big dilemma. How do I live without dying? <laughs> you try to, you know, figure that out. How can I live and not, and for the body not to get sick? The nature of the body is to get sick. And it will decay. That's what bodies do. So you try to figure out how I'm going to avoid being sick. Because if I get sick and I die, then there's no more me. You see? <coughs> and you're in tremendous. Now, once you add to that basic stress, right? <laughs> the stress of trying to keep your wife uh, married to you, <laughs> or your husband and your kids and your job, I mean, you are just a mess, aren't you? Yeah. <laughs> sure. I was reading some kind of survey that one of the universities did doing a measurement on uh, the misery index. looking and they were saying, my God, you know, uh, uh, some of the studies show that uh, like 85% of uh, all the people in this country is uh, miserable, mm -hmm. according to the scientific definition of what constitutes misery and so forth. Mm -hmm. All that misery is uh, ego-based. Something else to say about it? Yes, but other. What will a person experience once it becomes self-realized? Self what will the experience be like? Or is it different? Or did you um, there is a Hindu word that has been used to describe the feeling that uh, accompanies the experience of self-realization. They have called it Ananda. What does it mean, Monica? Bliss. Yes. <laughs> Bliss. When the Supra Buddha had the experience after overhearing just a few words of the Dharma as the uh, Tathagata wrote that Dharma on that day, uh, it's quoted in the Pali Sutra, says, exclaiming that uh, it's wonderful. That's, these are the kind of statements that they use when they try to describe what that feels like, you see, because you really can't describe it in words. That's the first thing. But nevertheless, they have tried to say something. So Supra Buddha said, it is wonderful. It is wondrous. He says it's like uh, 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 becoming right side up from having been wrong side down. <laughs> <laughs> he says it's uh, like uh, finding something precious that has been lost, you see. Uh, and he goes on and on and on, you see. And uh, you can read uh, his uh, exclamations uh, in the Bali Canon for yourself. But that's the kind of language, you see, uh, or lack of uh, language, if you will, that, that these mystics have resorted to, you see. Most simply become <coughs> silent. <coughs> Just silent about it. Because nothing can be said. Mm -hmm. Maharaji says it's almost like what happens to a, a person that can't talk, and you give them some sweet, and then you ask them how it tastes. <coughs> what can <coughs> he say? <laughs> he can't even talk. So he cannot communicate it, you see. All fear drops away. 
It's the opposite of what you're experiencing now. Just try to imagine. You know what you're experiencing now? Just the cessation of all of that. Hmm? That's what nirvana means, the cessation, the ending of dukkha. You see? It's over. You see? It is a state of desirelessness. There is no more desire. utter and absolute fulfillment. So there's not really much that can be said about it, you see. And so as a rule, most of the mystics have not left a, a great deal of literature that attempts to describe the experience because it's pretty futile but rather have focused on uh, guiding you into the experience itself, you see? Their answer to the question is to give you a taste. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Sometimes somebody asks you, how did this taste, and how, what can you say? You just break them off a piece. You know? <laughs> <laughs> break them off a little piece of something, something, right? <laughs> <laughs> and they know how it tastes, you see? <laughs> that's, that's the way to miss it. They break you off a piece. <laughs> Something else to say? Yes, beloved. I'd like for you to talk about this thing about losing sympathy with the ego. Um, you know, I'm, I'm seeing my ego like never before. And, you know, I, I don't know if awareness is a process or just a moment, but with this thing about awareness, if the awareness isn't full, you know, the ego's going to do its thing. Oh, yes, you know, yes. I'm, I'm hearing the thoughts and the oh, emotions yes, oh, and all yes. that. Now, losing a little bit of sympathy, just a little mm -hmm, bit. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The ego's doing its thing, but Did I you, just don't buy into what the ego wants me to yeah, do. Yeah, you actually it lose. Plays, yeah, you, you, what happened, beloved, you, you, you become strong enough to even look and see it. You're no longer defending yourself. You see? This uh, dropping of the defense of yourself is what I mean when when I say lose sympathy, you see? You're not trying to maintain it, <coughs> you follow me? Yeah. You see it in now, you see? You're, you're more open, you're more receptive, you, you're getting clear about it, you, you're becoming more detached, you see? And that process uh, depends on uh, each individual's own effort. Hmm? But certainly as you begin to really recognize the nature of your ego, the sign of such recognition is the loss of sympathy mm -hmm. and this uh, almost knee-jerk reaction to defend it. Mm -hmm. You see, you're able to, uh, uh, in some sense, overcome the, uh, the automatic mechanism in the ego that reboots itself mm -hmm. the very moment someone say or do anything that diminishes it. Are you with me? Mm -hmm. you, you, you're able to... Uh, sidetrack that hmm? to some extent. It's really interesting there's a kind of neurobiology as well that is going on, you see? Uh, in the uh, brain there's a set of uh, neurons called the uh, red nucleus cells. And these are the neurons and cells that wire our motor skill, behavior, physical, all of that stuff. And once a behavior has uh, been taken over by the red nucleus cells in the brain, that behavior is what we mean when we say you're wired. Mm -hmm. And that behavior cannot be changed unless you deliver a trauma. Mm -hmm. Hmm? You must become traumatized. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's what a glimpse of the ego does. It traumatizes you, right? <laughs> it's real traumatic, isn't it? <laughs> you can't believe you were that bad, right? And you were thinking you were that good. You actually were uh, arrogating to yourself virtues, and then you discovered that you are nothing but a pure, unadulterated manifestation of greed and selfishness, that you don't have a virtuous bone in your body. And when you see that, that traumatizes you, right? 
You see, it breaks that connection, right? You're seeing for yourself that all that you've been thinking you are is just pure bullshit, pure absolute bullshit. You've been walking around here thinking that you're a victim of this person, this circumstance, all bullshit. If anything, you are victimizing people. You are the <laughs> vampire. You're the one sucking people's blood. And when you see all of that, you see, it traumatizes the ego. And the ego will reboot itself if you don't catch it. It, will, it, will, it has an automatic rebooting mechanism built into it. Wow. Right? And the, the task is to uh, maintain a kind of inner non-reactivity hmm? to this automatic rebooting mechanism in your consciousness, to not allow yourself to reboot up again, hmm? to stand right there, sometimes what I call stand in the fire, you see, and let that fire purify you, you see, because that's what has to happen, you see, <clears throat> that has to happen. And I've talked to you on past occasion about grahata, the function of the sangha, other people in the sangha. All of that is to make you confront that in yourself. You see? If you don't have the ability or the willingness or the commitment to self-realization necessary to do the looking yourself, then grahata helps you, forces you, creates a situation where you force to see your bullshit. You know what I mean? Right? And it keeps hammering you, hammering you, there's no way to reboot now. You simply must accept what you're seeing. Yes, beloved? So when I don't have a good ego, mm -hmm. and I don't respond, even though I'm not responding, I'm still in a state. Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm still identifying with the ego, so the ego must burn. It's got to Yes, it's all burn that identification because must Because I'm go. not responding. That's right. You're okay. starving it. You see, you're transcending it in that moment to some degree, right? It may not all be gone, you see, because it has a pattern. It's red nucleus behavior, you see. Mm -hmm. but it's going to come back. It's going to come back. It's like an alcoholic. Even years after you stop drinking, sometimes that impulse to take a drink is still there. It's just, you know. But you don't have to act on it. You don't have to act on any impulse that arrives from you yeah. at all. <coughs> you really don't, you see. But uh, it's a real ordeal. It's a real struggle. It is real jihad, you see? And that is the real jihad, you know, not blowing up buildings, you see? It's the blowing up your ego, the nafs, you see? <laughs> <laughs> but that's an ordeal, right? And you can't enter into that ordeal if you're sympathetic. If you're trying to maintain and live up to this false image that you have fabricated and made up in your mind of who you are. You follow me? You're too sympathetic with it. You follow me? You're too defensive of it. You're trying to maintain it. You're trying to perpetuate it. You follow me? You're too attached to it. You haven't understood. You haven't seen. It's bullshit. It's just a story that you're making up about yourself. It ain't true at all. You see? And you can't do that unless you're for real. You will not do it unless you're for real. Hmm? And when you say that the ego is still arising, which means that you're still sympathizing with it at some point. Do you know what I mean? The, the thoughts don't go away, but it's still there. Mm -hmm. But that ego mechanism, you just don't give in to that. Right? Right. You, eventually, you see, beloved, you are able to liberate your attention from that whole stream of inner thinking that is producing the ego in the first place. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The ego mm -hmm. phenomenon is produced by thinking. Mm -hmm. And the, ultimately, you must transcend your thinking in order to really, truly have achieved the transcendence of ego. Very hard to transcend ego if you haven't transcended the thinking mechanism that is manufacturing it and sustaining it moment to moment. Are you following my argument? Mm -hmm. right. And that is the whole purpose of the spiritual practices that have been given to you at the time of your initiation, is to liberate your attention from the clutches of your mind and the maya that mind creates. 
And the major maya that mind creates, the major illusion that the mind creates, is the illusion that you are who you think you are. That's maya. I don't know what you all been thinking maya is. What did y'all think maya was? <laughs> The confusing of a snake for a rope in a dark path in a stormy forest. <clears throat> Maya is the illusion of the self you think you are. That's Maya. And that Maya is being sustained and maintained created by your thinking. So you must uh, liberate your sooted, liberate awareness from thinking. That's what enlightenment is. It is the liberation of awareness from the clutches of your mind. It is a separation of awareness and thinking. Do this make sense to you? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I mean, I don't only get lost today in just a lot of metaphysical uh, gobbledygook here. But that's what enlightenment is all about. It's about the liberation of pure awareness from the clutches and the limitation imposed upon it by thinking. You know you can exist without thinking, don't you? <laughs> right? I mean, if you, if you get out of your thinking, it ain't like you're going to die. Right? That's what it's all about. And so the... There's all kinds of ways of doing that, but in the tradition that I have offered you all, uh, we make use of similar budget and diyat, with an emphasis on budget, because by giving your attention to the sound, it's, it's easy to rise above your thinking, right? Many traditions use breath, you see? The body itself, they, because breathing is an automatic process, you don't have to do anything, so it's easier to concentrate, you see? Like some of you experience difficulty concentrating when you're doing your mantra because you got to do the mantra then concentrate on it and sometimes your level of skill is not there yet, right? Well, in some tradition, they don't even give you something that difficult to begin with. They start you at a more basic level, which is uh, uh, fixing your attention on your breathing because that's automatic. The downside, of course, it keeps you rooted in the body. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, the listening to the internal sound, the shove it, you see? Because you're not creating the shove it. Just like you're not creating your breath. The advantage of the shove it is that it's not body based. Mm -hmm. And yet it provides you with a, that same kind of framework or object that you need to put your attention on that you don't have to do nothing to create. You don't have to do anything to create. Shove it. Shove it is there. You just got to listen. Mm -hmm. Just like the breathing goes on, you just got to watch it, attend to it. But shove it is a superior form of practice. You see, it's a lot easier in some sense. Even. And it uh, certainly is uh, something that attracts attention far more effectively than your breath. Your breath don't normally attach, uh, attract your attention. Music do. Music just takes your attention. So ultimately, you have to give your attention to a sound that is more attractive than the sound of your mind because you, you all know every thought makes a sound, right? Mm -hmm. That's the only way you're able to have awareness of your thinking is because thoughts produce sound and energy. Mm -hmm. Actually three things. Every thought produces an image, a sound, and a packet of energy. That's why you, uh, your thoughts create feeling. It's a movement of energy. That movement of energy is called your emotions, right? But you all know all this stuff already, so let's talk about something else, huh? We, I guess don't want to hear this kind of nonsense. They want some deep talk, right? <laughs> Who have something deep they like to discuss?
become illusion into thinking that it's nothing. Mm. <laughs> Open like a true Andrews. <laughs> <laughs> well, there are many ways that we could uh, address that issue. Uh, one of the uh, explanations that uh, have been uh, suggested by different adepts uh, is very, fam very much like uh, the whole uh, uh, notion of uh, evolution. You're familiar with evolution, right? Evolution is the descent of the divine into forms. Once the divine descends into a form, it, it is constantly trying to evolve that form to a state where that form can become conscious of its own consciousness. Are you following me? It is uh, a kind of experiment, if you will, being conducted by the divine itself to see if it can create a bodily form in which it can maintain its awareness of being divine, right? Now, certain forms are structured differently. All these forms, there's the human form, there's the animal form. It's about 84,000 different material forms that consciousness can incarnate itself into to experiment on which of those forms is the best suited, right, for the sake of being able to be both form and formless simultaneously. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, it's interesting, Sardentiji, is that uh, over the course of aeons, uh, or time that we cannot even calculate, you see, it has come upon this particular form that is the human form. Thus far, at this point, in the evolution of forms, this human form has proven to be the most uh, adapted form, the best form for such a phenomenon to occur, you see? So as this human form evolves itself more and more, hmm, it will become capable hmm, of holding on to the realization of being divine even while in the body. And that is what will create a whole nother kind of earth, a whole nother kind of universe, a whole different kind of galaxy, you see? Now, I don't know if that helped you mm -hmm. at all. The ultimate answer, though, is uh, Sardentiji, is that we don't know. Nobody knows. They have therefore called it Leela to suggest what the divine does. It's this game. It's this joy. It's this pleasure. But nobody knows. How can you comprehend it? It's incomprehensible. It's unfathomable. The ancient African sages in the uh, book of the transformation of Ra, uh, somewhere in there they talk about the fact that uh, you can know a lot of things, hmm? but you can't know that. Nobody can know that. It's unknowable, unfathomable. Just can't know it. There is a uh, limit on what the human intellect can comprehend. And to try to comprehend that which is beyond the limit of your intellect is an exercise in futility. It just can't comprehend it. This is what uh, Albert Einstein and a lot of the great physicists made as the goal of their research, you see, Sardentiji. They were trying to understand the mind of God. That's what physics is all about, originally. Physics was born out of philosophy, right? It's a child of philosophy. And these philosophers reached a point in their quest for wisdom that they became focused on trying to understand the mind of God because they had understood enough about this cosmos to appreciate the fact that this did not just happen. You see? 
you all familiar with the concept of intelligent design, what they call an intelligent design today? Mm -hmm. You know, it was something like that was the underlying motive that gave birth to science. And so it's ironic that science and uh, <coughs> religion are separate, you know. They, mm -hmm. Once upon a time, they were not, you see. Mm -hmm. They were co-partners in the same quest to try to understand God's mind. But you can't. Not from where you're at. You see my point? Does that help you a little bit, beloved? Well, I'm surprised. <laughs> it didn't help me at all when I found it out. <laughs> see, it doesn't reduce your suffering. You see, that's why Buddha and many other great adepts uh, never even address these kind of conversations because they really don't reduce your suffering. Your problem is you suffer. Let's deal with suffering and the ending of suffering. And we'll deal with all this uh, high metaphysical stuff later, you see. Yes, beloved. Can you talk a little bit about the connection or anything um, with what the book talks about? We've had namaste practice mm -hmm. that you've given us, as well as how the book talks about really concentrating on an object, concentrating on things, body, whatever, to merge with that and how that is, con just say anything about that process being this way of stopping the thinking, you know, of merge really becoming being or connecting. Let uh, Madhunatha answer those kind of questions. <laughs> <laughs> She's good at that. Uh, that's a Madhunatha question. Uh, I'm not sure I'm following you. I don't know. I just thought you may say something. <laughs> <laughs> If you stupid, everybody gonna know it. That's how you do it. But surely you see, beloved, you say something about it. And as you uh, all recall, Namaste is uh, cultivating the ability to see a person beyond uh, the level of their egos. Namaste is developing uh, that kind of uh, awareness that enables you to remain uh, uh, non-reactive to other people's ego, both internally as well as externally. But in order to practice that, you must, of course, achieve first the ability to remain non-reactive to your own ego. Okay. If you have no ability to remain non-reactive to your own ego, you will, by definition, react to the egos of other people. You see? If you have not achieved a degree of self-realization that enables you to see clearly that you are not your ego, if you, there's a point b that you reach in the self-observation, beloved, what's your name, beloved? <coughs> William, there's a point in that uh, self-observation process where you really realize and see now clearly that I am not equal to all of this stuff that I've been calling myself. You really see that. And with that realization, not only comes your own liberation from misidentification with your body, mind, and the contents of being who you are, you're also in that same instance liberated from that presumption about others. You see, if I'm not my ego, then nobody is their ego either. Are you with me? You can't have uh, the realization that I'm not the ego and you still are presuming that other people are theirs. That's a fallacy. That's more ego. That's more ego. You see? Neither you are your ego or anybody else. And your ability to see and realize and experience yourself beyond the limitation of your own ego automatically confers on you the ability to practice namaste for real with other people. That is, you are able to move beyond their egos and see them more in the light of who and what they truly <coughs> are, which, of course, is the same as you. Are you with me? <coughs> 
that's uh, a point of view of others uh, that is uh, <coughs> trans egoic. And so this experience of merging is the experience of oneness, you see? It's the realization that uh, I am because we are. We are because I am. We are one. There's no more duplicity and duality, you see? Just like there's only one life in this room, one life. The same life in, that is in you, Tedavadaji, is the same life in me. It's the same in you. It's the same in this plant. It's the same in the ant crawling in the corner there, the, the bug outside on the window. It's only one life manifesting in different forms. You see? Now, you can relate to the bug at the level of its form, <coughs> squash it. Or you can relate to it. <coughs> the level of life. And you might, because of that connection, not squash it. <coughs> the ego, by definition, is the absence of a feeling of connection with other people, things, in the world. By definition, make a note of that. That's what ego is. It's the absence of a feeling of connection. You see? at that deepest level, you see. That's what the ego does. It, it seeks to separate itself. I don't even like the word separate. What it's really doing is trying to exempt itself. Mm -hmm. Right? The ego is a self-exempting mechanism in consciousness where you try to exempt yourself, even from the laws of nature. Mm -hmm. Right? That's why you can uh, look around and see everybody dying and really feel that you ain't going to die. <laughs> I mean, really, I mean, you really feel that you're not going to die. That's not going to happen to me. You can see everybody else uh, experiencing all kind of unfortunate events, but that ain't going to happen to me. You exempt yourself, you see, from the very laws of nature, from the world. And then you try to live this uh, exempt and radically independent life which is impossible. It's what the ego does. It, it's the feeling of being exempt. And independent of everyone and everything. Is that about right? Yes. Who will have the last question? Yes, uh, Brother Black? How are you doing, beloved? It's a pretty little baby there. It's a pretty little baby. Yes, brother. I'm going to ask a question about the ego. Acha. Does the ego attract like minded egos or life forms in it? And, uh, <laughs> according to the degree of that life development, does it attract? Yeah, that's a real good question. <laughs> <laughs> you ask me what you're saying, beloved, is uh, very much how, how it works in a sense. Uh, what the ego does, it attracts complementary others. You know, uh, it's about complementarity. And that's a little bit more subtle of a concept. For instance, uh, I have an image of myself, right? Uh, let's say that image of myself is that uh, I am uh, <clears throat> I'm all this in a bag of chips. I'm very important, right? So I will try to attract people to me, right, that will validate that image that I have of myself, right? Those are the people I would try to really attract to me. I'll come up with some kind of behaviorism to attract those. But here's the thing that is so profound about what you say, is that when you encounter pe other people who are just like you, <laughs> Whether you attracted them or not, right? <laughs> but in some larger sense, you are attracted to them, you know, in a larger sense. But those are the situations where you come in in contact with people who are just like you, and how do you know it? Conflict. Yeah, conflict. Yeah. 
Conflict. 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 Right. Yeah. That's what, uh, and that's it. So when we say you attract others that are like you, don't look for that to play out in your love life. <laughs> that I'm attract a loving mate. That, that is not the law of attraction <laughs> that works in the universe. Okay, wow. But you're going to find you are constantly attracting people in your life that is just bumping his conflict in you. Because that's how you are. <laughs> you can't get these assholes out of your life because you're an asshole. <laughs> Simple. <laughs> no mystery, right? Do the math. <laughs> You see my point? And that's exactly what is happening. You see? That's exactly what is happening. Even when you react to other people with uh, uh, anger and all of these other things, that's because it's, it's you. <laughs> you react into something that is in you. You are just like the people you are having all this conflict with. Exactly. That's why they, that's why you haven't y'all keep meeting each other in the universe. You know? And if they die, another one replaces them. <laughs> you know, you're like, Same shit. <laughs> Cause it's you. You create a electromagnetic field of energy around your body. Right? It's electromagnetic. Notice. Mm -hmm. And it attracts. It pulls. So unless you change, then uh, you're going to keep uh, attracting people just like you. And that's, that's hell. <laughs> right? I mean, you'll try to avoid them. <laughs> yes, Brother Black. So would that be a divine sign of like how to read, like, uh, study yourself? Like yes, sir. Like your growth and your, and your absolutely, growth. absolutely, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Because you are in the company of people who are just like you. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not a fluke that you're around all these noble people. You belong <laughs> to that's, that's where you vibrate. At. That's where your energy is. At. Right? But that can be a good thing too. Right? Because if you can develop some wisdom and see that, right? It liberates you from all this condemning people. You see my point? That drops because you understand that who my company is a reflection of who I am. That's the law. You follow me? So if I got a beef with these people, let me change. Right? That's the real solution to conflict. If that I change, then I won't be attracting them. But if you don't change, they're going to, you're just going to, you're going to bump into them at the store, on the airplane, <laughs> work next to them on the job. I mean, where would you go? You cannot violate the law. There's no way you can go in this universe and escape the experience of who you are. dramatized through the people, circumstance, and situation that arises in your life. It's not going to happen. See, that's what the ego is trying to do, right? Because the ego always blame it on who? <coughs> always. Not me. <laughs> I'm this grand person, you know, that I propagandize myself as, you know. That ain't true. Yeah. You really do reap what you sow. Right now. Moment to moment. Don't have to die to reap what you sow. You'll reap it from moment <coughs> to moment to moment in the form of people, places, things, and experiences that it's making up your day-to-day -day life. So if you're around a lot of miserable people because you are miserable, SOB yourself. <laughs> it's not a flattering truth, but if you're a seeker for truth, that's what you come here for, right? 
that truth will liberate you. So the ego is a, a terrible condition to be in. I guess that's the whole point that uh, all of this talk is uh, aimed to uh, impress upon you, is that uh, the egoic condition is a horrible condition to be in. You see? The saints have likened it to being sick. In Buddhism, there's the four noble metaphors. You all remember them, right? The first of the four noble metaphors says what? Oh, noble one, you must look upon yourself as being You're sick. Now, this is sick. Always at war. Always fighting with somebody. Always blaming. Always complaining. Always moaning. Always groaning. Always bitching. This is a sick state of mind. This is sickness. This is real mental illness. This is insanity. You must see how you really are. That's real right view. You must really have the right view of your real condition. This is sick. You must see it. You lose all sympathy in defense of that condition. This is prerequisite. I like one of the lines that totally reminds us, us about in the Toli Sutra where he quotes Jesus saying, you must deny yourself. this ego. You must deny this ego. It is not who you are. It's not even in your best interest to remain an ego. It is the source of your suffering. And for those who are, will approach the spiritual path, you must, you must be able to uh, realize and recognize and see your own ego. If you can't see your own ego in this operation moment to moment, you can't have self-realization, by definition. It will never happen. You must first realize who you are not. And there's a lot of uh, people on the path, a lot of you in the room who are on the path, who simply do not yet have the capability or even the inclination to really look at yourself as You'll look at other people. When you were reading the, the Toli Sutra in the margin of your book, and what kept popping in your mind, that jazz like so and so, so and so. <laughs> Y'all even wrote their name in the margin. <laughs> Lest you forget. <laughs> That's why you in it. You should see how popular you are. <laughs> you, you didn't know you were that popular. Look at that book. <laughs> right? <laughs> But there's very few sections where you say, that's just like me. That's just like me. That's just like me. That's just like me. You don't have your name there. And you're not going to benefit from the, the sutra at all. You must be able to recognize and see and observe and radically observe your own ego mechanism. Because if you can't recognize your ego, how will you transcend it? How can you transcend something you can't even see? How are you going to do that? I mean, really, seriously now. How are you going to do that? You can't. So this business about uh, understanding your ego self is a serious business. It's not a mere uh, philosophical uh, activity to engage in, you see? It's not something to be guessed at. Oh, I guess I'm like this. No, that ain't going to work. You must know precisely. Exactly. You see? 
with pinpoint accuracy. And you must be able to recognize the ego mechanism in yourself and then become uh, non-reactive to that mechanism as a prerequisite for loving other people. As long as you are operating out of the uh, reactivity of your own ego, you're not going to love anybody. You can't love anybody. nor can anybody really love you for long. No, that's your experience. Your experience is that people are not loving you very long. Mm -hmm. Fundamentally. Mm -hmm. They can love you about 15, 20 minutes, but that's not <laughs> all they can tell you. I mean, really, I mean, really, seriously. Our children are there because they got to eat. <laughs> Baba Dave don't like you, man. <laughs> Baba Dave come over the house and said, Baba, my daddy. <laughs> Files all his grievances with me. <laughs> the average other human being can take about 15, 20 minutes of you. And then they're just about sick of your ass. <laughs> and that's the truth. <laughs> that's why you're not ex having the experience of being loved. Don't you get it? <laughs> Don't you get it yet? You stink. <laughs> People don't want to be around you unless they have to. <laughs> Are you following me? Yes. <laughs> unless they can find some other fringe benefit of the relationship. Uh, you make a lot of money, so I guess I'll stay married to you. <laughs> you have a nice salary. <laughs> you know what I mean? I have put up with them. You know what I mean? But they ain't there strictly because of you. They couldn't stay in a relationship with you strictly because of you. Are you clear? Yes. Ego stinks. Stop glorifying. You see? The way you think you are is messed up. It's all screwed up. It's ugly. It's an ugly thing. It's a horrible thing. There ain't nothing good about it. And as long as you are, are devoting all your time, energy, and attention to its maintenance, you are simply going to guarantee yourself the experience of lovelessness. That's all you do. The more you maintain it, the less love you're going to have the experience of from others. That's all. And because of the experience of lovelessness, your level of dukkha will rise in you. Your suffering will become more and more profound. You see? And you will seek more and more ways to be relieved of such suffering. You'll look for more and more distractions, but alas, eventually you will run out of uh, strategies of avoiding your fundamental miserable condition, you see? You will have a pretended life. Are you with me? You'll have to watch a lot of television. <laughs> right? That's the only world that you can uh, live in is the uh, TV land somewhere. You see? You can't live out here. <coughs> Too much to be confronted with uh, the loneliness of your life. So there's no mystery why nobody is with you. No great mystery about it. Just look at yourself. Who will want to be with you?
get ready for uh, some pressure.